Kelsey Hunley will narrate the following description of Buddhism, which is a summary of the two books, Zen for Americans by Soyan Shaku, and the book The Art of Happiness, a Handbook for Living by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutler. Those of us humans who are Buddhists believe that people should not lie, cheat, steal, or kill. Buddhists acknowledge that it is hard not to be selfish, not to be angered when slighted, and not to abuse one's authority. Buddhists believe that suffering occurs and that it is common and that selfishness and ignorance are the roots of every person's troubles. When we mistakenly believe the universe is something it is not, then our resulting expectations cannot be fulfilled and we will cause our, our own suffering. Shaku explains Buddhism to a Christian audience. At the heart of Buddhism is the story of Buddha's realization. Buddha is a teacher, not a prophet. The teachings of Buddhism are those of a human being who speaks not for God, but out of his own experience. Buddhism offers teachings and instructions. It does not proclaim dogma. A statement derives its value from the help it provides in attaining enlightenment, not from its source. Buddhists believe conduct counts for more than belief. Buddhism emphasizes proper behavior and salvation here and now, not in an afterlife. The Buddhist does not say God, but instead says oneness. Buddhists believe in the oneness of things, that there is a unifying principle in all phenomena. Buddhists also believe that all things are different and that all things work on all other things. This is karma. In How to Practice, The Way to a Meaningful Life, the Dalai Lama says that karma is a tendency created by previous actions. Buddhists do not believe there is a supernatural deity, but will talk of persons of extremely virtuous behavior as if they are gods. This is done as a tool to teach moral excellence. Buddhists reject the idea of an omnipotent being. On a first reading of this section, Christians might choose to replace the word oneness with God, where some of us say nature, others say God, love, oneness, Allah, Jehovah, or Jesus. We are all really talking about much the same thing, the idea of a unifying love between all of us. These approaches differ in whether or not this is deified. Oneness is the highest reality and truth. Oneness abides in all things and is infinite. Oneness is in all of us and is the world. We are one with all, not separate from each other. Oneness is within each of us. Everyone is within everyone else. There is a universal oneness. We are all together. Since every person is within each of us, you should treat everyone as if they were you, because they are. I am within you, and you are within me. Seeing that we are all basically the same may help you feel oneness with every member of humankind and help you see that the group is what is important, not one individual. We should all work to improve the group. If you regulate your thoughts and deeds according to the feelings of oneness, then a wondrous spiritual truth will be in your heart, and you will then treat all others as family and friends, not as strangers. When you see oneness in everyone and in everything, then you have attained nirvana. A person who has attained nirvana will know truth. The heart is then cleansed of all egotistic impurities and will practice loving kindness to all. This will be your reward on earth. There is no heaven. You will be a good person who is above bigotry, intolerance, hate, vanity, and conceit. You will be humble, practice forgiveness, and have compassion for others. Your spiritual insight will penetrate into the depths of your existence. Attaining nirvana means becoming a good person because you have realized that oneness is everything and that everyone is one and the same. Buddhists say there is no heaven, nor is there a coming reward in heaven, so do not sit in the tranquility of mind relying on God. You will not sit in happy, inexpressible bliss forever at the side of the Creator. Instead, you will be reborn, not as another person, but within another person who is taking up where you left off. Your life's deeds and your contribution to the world's understandings are their own reward and are what will live on after you have left. Let your life's work make you live forever. 
just as a house is composed of its pieces and does not have a soul, when you gather the pieces of a person, then it is a person and does not have a soul. The body turns to dust. Buddhists see that ignorance is the root of all evil. We are selfish only because we are ignorant of the true nature of the universe. Perfect peace occurs when egoism goes away. Egoism goes away when I recognize myself in you because I have come to understand that we are all one, that we are each a part of each other. I then will love you and treat you right. The divine love in our hearts is now unobstructed. When this truth becomes understood, then we are enlightened. This is why Buddhism is called the religion of enlightenment. The Dalai Lama says that enlightenment is a state in which mind and body are fully developed to be of service to others. Buddhism recognizes the reality of the phenomena of the world, the existence of ultimate reason, and the imminence of this reason in the universe. The universe is this ultimate reason. Oneness is this universe and this ultimate reason. Within each of us is the indwelling reason for the universe. The Dalai Lama explains that a coiled rope looks like a snake, but it is not. It is a snake only while it is supposed to be one by a person who is ignorant of its true nature. One may think that a piece of furniture is real, but that too is just a mental construct. That piece of furniture consists of a tree and the labor of a carpenter. In fact, it also consists of atoms, nuclei, and elementary particles. It does not exist independently of its components. It is a mental construct just as is the coiled rope snake. Those things that do not independently exist, they are not permanent, they are not real, they are mental constructs. You are also a mental construct in that you do not exist independently of your parts, which include limbs, liver, mind, and atoms and such. What you construe to be you at this moment is different than you of the past or future. The wisdom of emptiness is the knowledge that things do not exist independently of their parts. We exist but do not independently exist. Other things exist, but everything is a construct, and so do not independently exist. Hate and greed and such do not exist, because they too are constructs. Misconceiving the independent existence of phenomena, including ourselves, is what allows hatred and greed and such to occur. Understanding the true nature of reality removes suffering. Between the two extremes of thinking that everything exists or that nothing exists is the truth of the middle way that the existence of everything depends on its parts and on other items. The practical part of the religion is its efforts to stop wrongdoing. You must start being a good person, promote goodness, and enlighten the ignorant. This is a simple faith. There are no mysterious superstitions or supernatural deities, just good behavior toward all. It is said that every three-year-old knows how to behave, but even a silver-haired person still has trouble living that way. However, life as a saint is not enough. The mind must also know the meaning of life and the true significance of existence. Life is good and bad things, but we should be above both. Life is worth living because it gives us a chance to work, to apply ourselves, and to realize moral and spiritual aspirations. Life is not meant just to enjoy passing pleasures while we are here. There are both natural laws and spiritual laws in the universe. When an evil act is committed, the entire universe is sorrowful because the act slows both progress and the attainment of goodness. Life is not for mere living, but is a path that leads to goodness and oneness. When you feel a noble feeling or do a self-sacrificing deed, then you'll see that the spirit of oneness is making itself felt within you, including the spirit of all who have come before us and have contributed to the goodness of the world. Reincarnation means that your life's contributions are reused forever. The fourfold noble truth is that life is suffering. That ignorance causes suffering. That nirvana transcends pleasure and pain is the goal of our life. And that moral laws must be put into practice to reach nirvana. Truth isn't revealed to us by a supernatural force, but is discovered ourselves through a faculty that can be acquired by all beings. Buddhism is not to be believed blindly, but to be believed rationally. It is to be believed because it is true, not simply because a mystical person has proclaimed it to be true. 
Buddhists are tolerant of other religions and do not have the bloody past of some of the others. There was no holy war nor an inquisition. Truth is universal and the same for all races and nations. Buddhists believe that Christ's words are truths. In fact, Buddhists and Christians, and the followers of every other religion too, agree that each person must love all other persons. Christ and Buddha taught the same things. The Dalai Lama says that as long as hatred dwells in our minds, there will not be peace among peoples, and that the weapons-backed attempt of one nation to dominate another is counterproductive. Our common humanity must call us to action in ridding the world of weapons and armies. To describe something of the daily practice of Buddhism, I next summarize The Art of Happiness, A Handbook for Living, by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutler. Cutler, who is a psychiatrist, interviewed the Dalai Lama extensively about the steps needed to obtain personal happiness, and then compared the Buddhist approach with that of the Western psychiatric practices. Their discussion makes it clear that Buddhism is a lifelong internal reflection rather than a faith in an external agent. Cutler explains that many of the observations, conclusions, and personal improvement techniques of Buddhists are well matched to those of psychiatrists that resulted from scientific studies of human behavior. Cutler and the Dalai Lama's book has been aptly described as an intriguing encounter between East and West. The Dalai Lama says that the meaning of life is to seek happiness. The level of our happiness is not genetically preset, but is to be pursued. It can be obtained through years of concerted mental effort by cultivating positive mental states and rejecting negative mental states. When you are unhappy, identify what has caused your unhappiness and don't do that again. Avoid the situation that caused your suffering. Similarly, identify and repeat those things that make you happy. Each night you might evaluate the actions you took that day to decide if they did or did not make you more happy. Do not rate an action to be positive or negative based on an immediate feeling or s of satisfaction, but on its long-term consequences. The temporary pleasure of food or sex is not happiness. Don't ask if this feels good, ask if it makes you happy. For example, consuming to satisfy, instead, leads to greed and unhappiness, especially when you find you don't have enough money to buy everything. In the long run, consuming leaves you depressed, not happy. The true antidote to greed is a commitment to appreciate what we have. Our happiness level is closely related to our perception of our current situation and how satisfied we are with what we have. Some feel happy while having wealth, but we all agree that love, health, friendship, affection, closeness, and compassion bring much happiness. Various things make us unhappy. For example, we might be unhappy if we think others are better off. If you look inside yourself, you might agree that we are most unhappy when we are not moving toward our goals. But our general mental attitude takes precedence over these things because one might be unhappy even while having plenty of money and being surrounded by friends. The Dalai Lama says that we are happiest when our actions are socially accepted. This is not a self-centered happiness. We are fundamentally nurtured by the affection of others. Each person needs to feel a sense of dignity and a sense of worth to the other member of the community. Just relating to fellow humans and feeling a mutual bond satisfies that sense of worth. A despot can own everything and rule the world, but will feel that life is lacking if he or she does not have affection for other humans or feel a connection with them. We are happiest with ourselves when others like us. Suffering is universal and begins on the day you are born. It enters every person's life and it enters often. Do not take the view that bad situations are rare and are due to bad luck. Instead, expect bad times to occur, and to occur often, for it is a natural part of your existence. Be tolerant of its occurrence because everyone suffers bad times. You are not alone in your suffering, nor are you a special target of suffering, because you deserve it. Many others are going through the same situation, and some have it far worse than you. You gain nothing by thinking your troubles are unfair to you. Face your troubles head on and tackle them by spending your efforts on the solution, not the problem that has already occurred and cannot be undone. The Dalai Lama says that he personally uses the following approach to deal with excessive concern about a problem itself. 
If a situation can be remedied, then there's no need to worry about it. If the problem has no solution at all, then you can't do anything about it, and so again, there's no reason to worry about it. While feeling pain, say to yourself, may I help others not to experience this pain and not to be in the same situation that caused the pain. Be grateful for the privilege of pain because you'll then know what to help others avoid and you'll be better able to empathize with others having pain. Cutler explains that biologically, pain effectively alerts us when something to avoid is happening. Without pain, harm would grow because we wouldn't end the cause of the pain. Hard times build determination and inner strength. Without hard times, our character would only maintain its level. We may feel we are suffering during hard times, but they rarely bring failure. Failure is caused only by hopelessness. Notice that the best time to prepare oneself for bad times is during the good times, while being satisfied with your situation and condition. We get through tough times by developing and maintaining a steady, even-keeled attitude toward life. One should strive to restrain all mental extremes. Developing a calmness of mind is a Buddhist goal. Such peace of mind is rooted in compassion and affection for others. Don't cause your own suffering by dwelling on a bad event or by trying to ignore the fact that a change has occurred. Life has changed, so expect it to occur. Do not think that you can stop change from occurring. For example, you will only make yourself unhappy if you do not accept the fact that you will grow old and have less beauty and ability. As another example, do not divorce at the first sign of change in your relationship with your spouse. Initially, you might feel that the most important element of your relationship is your shared passion, but in time, find that true love is being committed to the change and growth of your spouse. Don't cause your own suffering by having an excessive ego. Notice that worry and pessimism are fought with reasoned and positive thoughts and attitudes. You might overcome anxiety about a past action by reminding yourself of your compassionate motive and your tremendous personal talents, accomplishments, and potential. For example, after losing a job or failing a class, you might feel you are worthless, unless you remind yourself of the difficult jobs and courses in which you have done well. Plus, you have a nice singing voice and have been a good friend to others. How do you achieve liberation from suffering? Upon reflection, you will see that you have caused much of your own suffering through craving, ignorance, or hatred. This means that you can liberate yourself from suffering by liberating your mind from those thoughts. Compassion is a state of mind that is non-violent, non-harming, and non-aggressive. Most of all, compassion is a deep sensitivity to the feelings of others, especially to the suffering of others, be it a person or any other sentient being. You'll agree that you are a human being who wants to be happy and does not want to suffer. Recognize that all others are also human beings who want to be happy and do not want to suffer. To cultivate your compassion, you might practice mentally envisioning someone in pain or in a bad situation. Reflect on that person's suffering for a few moments and then remind yourself that that person has the same capacity for experiencing pain, joy, happiness, and suffering as you do. Do you then feel compassion for that person and wish strongly for that suffering of that person to end? Now resolve yourself to help end that person's suffering. For a few moments, try to hold your mind in a state of compassion. Imagine being surrounded by the suffering people of the world, and then try to remove their suffering to yourself. Imagine all seven billion persons on the planet thinking simultaneously about ending each other's pain. This would soon put an end to war. Isn't it part of our nature to care about our fellow beings? Without compassion, one is not human. Have a feeling of compassion and loving kindness for fellow humans. Your warmth will be both received and returned. Possess a spirit of openness and friendship and others will trust you. Anger, Jealousy and hatred are harmful. Be patient. Even when pushed, yelled at, hit, embarrassed, or insulted, do not return that action. The Dalai Lama describes other specific mental exercises to help you cultivate your own character. 
Imagine an egotistical version of yourself who is ignoring a group of people in need. You know that both you and the members of this group want to be happy and do not want to suffer. It is simply not good to be egotistical. Since all persons have an equal right to be happy, you can see that the needs of a group of many persons has priority over the needs of a single person. Since you will make temporary sacrifices in hope of obtaining a greatly improved future for yourself, notice that it makes perfect sense for you to make sacrifices in order to help a group of persons. You must serve and help others. Further imagine a field of all the people in the past who have done good. Tell them of your bad deeds, and then restrain from repeating those deeds as if they were poison. From the depths of your heart, admire your own good deeds. Take joy in the knowledge of the good deeds of others. Think again and again and again. May I become able to help all beings. A moral authority is not required to teach you right from wrong. You naturally feel good or bad while doing things. You know which things make you happy and which do not. We don't have to be trained to know right and wrong, but with experience become better at pursuing wholesome behavior. The resulting inner peace is well worth striving for. It also takes some experience to learn that small acts can have large consequences. Parents who control their emotions, model caring behavior, and set limits on the behavior of their children often produce caring and compassionate children. Help your child see the consequences of their behavior by discussing their effect on other people and ask your child to reflect on how they feel when a person is kind to them. During a dispute, reduce your own anger towards others by taking the viewpoint of every involved person. Patience and tolerance are the antidotes for anger and hatred. Have love and kindness for everyone. Be grateful for the occasional person who acts against you because they give you a chance to put yourself in their place and to see the situation from the viewpoint of an antagonist. Without enemies, we would not get the opportunity to better ourselves. Enemies give us a chance to practice patience, tolerance, compassion, and our calmness of mind. If you build and maintain a calmness of mind, even your enemies cannot disturb you. Our life is meaningful, peaceful, and happy when we practice warmth, kindness, and compassion. We live only for a few decades. If you cannot serve other human beings, then at least refrain from harming them. We are linked to the efforts, cooperation, and compassion of others. Everything you use, from pencils to cars, is made by somebody else. The efforts of numerous persons went into making your shirt. We are not self-reliant, but are interdependent and interconnected. We require others. If a person feels he or she is self-sufficient, and does not need or care about others, then he or she does not understand our actual interdependence. Do not cloud your good nature with the negative emotions of conceit, arrogance, jealousy, desire, lust, closed-mindedness, anger, or hatred. These are not overcome by simply suppressing them. Beware of them as they are developing within yourself during the moments in which some situation is unfolding, and you will be better able to thwart them at their onset by combating them with suggested antidotes. Analyze your behaviors later to decide if they were appropriate and if they were constructive or destructive. If you become angry, it will diminish your ability to distinguish right from wrong. This ability is one of the highest human attributes. While being angry, you'll experience a temporary insanity and even look ugly. People, even your own pets, will avoid you. You will lose sleep and your appetite will be gone. Anger and hatred arise from dissatisfaction and discontent and are combated by building inner contentment and cultivating kindness, patience, and tolerance. To meditate on anger, you might imagine an angry person's physical ugliness and choose not to be that person again. Say to yourself, I will never do that again. Notice that it takes a strong, self-disciplined mind to respond with patience and tolerance while someone is harming you. Humility is having the capacity to take a more confrontational response, but deliberately deciding not to do so. Forgiveness results from patience and tolerance. Cutler and the Dalai Lama say that bringing about discipline within one's mind to do wholesome things is the essence of Buddhist teaching. Human nature is fundamentally good, gentle, and compassionate. We are like clear water occasionally muddied by bad thoughts that soon settle out to again leave the water clear. This is referred to as our Buddha nature. 
We are fundamentally good, but must strive to obtain a calm, affectionate, and wholesome mind. A concerted and prolonged internal evaluation of oneself, meditation, develops this inner state and also helps to change the way we conduct our daily life and interact with others. See others as fellow human beings. Each of us has the marvelous gift of human intelligence and a capacity to develop determination and to use it in positive ways. A warm heart respects the views and rights of others. Seeing others as basically good and compassionate instead of hostile and selfish allows us to relax, trust, and live at ease. For example, approach strangers assuming they are good people. You will then be happier. It has been mentioned in previous chapters that scientists will first try to guess how nature behaves in a specific circumstance and then are often surprised when their measurements reveal how nature actually does behave. For centuries, Buddhists have been looking internally at the state of mind of a person having relationships with other human beings. Cutler makes numerous and fascinating comparisons between the practices of Buddhism and psychiatry. Psychiatrists conduct scientific studies of people, including such things as the chemical basis of behavior, the effects of mental health on physical health, and the interactions of pairs of individuals forming a social system. They test methods in which unhealthy behavior can be altered to regain one's mental and physical health. Buddhists have looked inside themselves and correctly identified naturally healthy behavior and ways to correct unhealthy behavior. People have trouble correctly guessing the behavior of nature, but are able to look inside themselves and see their own nature. We know what makes us happy or sad, and we know what sort of interactions with others will make us feel good. We just aren't good at guessing specific aspects of nature, for example, whether or not ashes will float on water. We see that the daily practice of religion for a Buddhist does not involve deity worship. Buddhism is a lifelong internal evaluation of one's outlook, efforts, and actions in order to feel compassion and loving kindness towards others. Obtain internal peace maintain a calmness of mind free of extremes, keep a positive outlook even during the times of suffering that will occur, face trouble head on, acknowledge and accept change, have caring relationship with others, receive approval from others, and have a sense of commonality with and respect for all other living creatures. Have a belief in the goodness of all human beings because we share much in common. Don't instead search for and emphasize our fewer differences.